I've been working on my threes, really trying to add some range to my game, which is going to be weird for people to see, I guess, because they're used to seeing me in the paint battling. But in order for me to play longer, I have to expand my game. You are locked on fantasy basketball, your daily podcast on fantasy basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and as always you can find me on Twitter at RedRock underscore B-Ball, on Instagram at RedRock underscore B-Ball and Facebook at Facebook.com slash RedRockBasketball. We're here today with another of the Season in Review series podcasts. We're going to be talking about the Atlanta Hawks, so let's get to it, to it. Let's get to it indeed. Just another reminder, if you haven't heard it, go back uh, two days ago and check out the 2017 NBA draft preview I did with the Sporting News' Sam Vecini. Uh, lots of great info in there, and we'll be doing another NBA draft preview show with another draft expert next week. So I think that'll be, actually, I think it'll be, I think I said Tuesday, I think it's going to be Thursday, but that will be next week. So, uh, so check out that as well. Also, um, across the Locked On Podcast Network, it's Mock Draft Week next week. So on Locked On NBA with David Locke, we'll have every team across the Locked On Podcast Network making their selections in the draft. And then they'll all be uh, chiming in with their, their thought processes on their selection on that show throughout the week. So for the five days of the week, there'll be uh, mock draft shows over on Locked On NBA, so I do suggest that you uh, you check that out, and uh, I'll be doing my own mock draft uh, a day before the draft, so that's a couple of weeks away, so that'll be something that we do after these team review series podcasts are done. As I said, we are here talking today about the Atlanta Hawks, a team that was, um, I don't know, pretty pretty interesting during the season with uh, which way are they going to go. They traded Kyle Korver, and that was the... Uh, People thought, well, well, yeah, I think rightfully so, that, that was the indication they were going to start selling off assets and the Millsap was going to go and where was this team going to land? And in the end, the Hawks backed off that plan. They retained Millsap. They may not retain him at the end of the season or now in free agency. Who knows what they're going to do there? They just appear destined to be sort of stuck in the middle. And that's... Um, that's not great. That could have some you know, significant impact for some of their players fantasy-wise. But uh, for the team as a franchise as a whole, you feel that they are they are definitely on the downward slide uh, right about now. They finished last season as a forty three and thirty nine team, but they uh, their point differential had them as just a thirty nine win team, so they overperformed their expectations by four wins. So that's uh, that's a little troubling in itself. And when they had that sixty win season, I believe they overperformed their expectations by like eight nine wins something in that season. So that's a huge amount. And a lot of that comes down to the, the individual players and that luck factor going their way and coaching. So you can't just continually write it off, um, much like with the, with the Grizzlies, who are a team that's consistently been able to sort of beat the luck aspect of, of games by by just being who they are and the players they are and the scheme they have. It, eventually, it turns into something a little bit more than that. And maybe that's the case with the Hawks. But uh, yeah, when their point differential suggests they should be a 39-win team, the, the signs it can be a little bit troubling. They do have uh, three picks in this upcoming draft. They have pick 19, their own first rounder. They also have pick 31, which is obviously the second round pick, but it's the best second round pick that you could get. It's the first pick in the second round, and in pretty much every case, it's preferable to pick 30 in the NBA because you're not locked into a four-year deal. You have negotiation rights with this player. You can uh, you can offer you know, differing types of contracts rather than just being locked into a four-year rookie scale. And a lot of people will prefer that pick 31 to say pick 30 just for that extra flexibility. So they've got the, they've got a good pick there. They also have pick 60, which is pretty much, unless it's Isaiah Thomas, it's pretty much going to turn into nothing. When we look at the free agents, though, this is where the, uh, the concern arises. Of course, Paul Millsap has opted out of his player option. He is an unrestricted free agent. There is absolutely zero surprise with that. That has nothing to do with his intentions of if he, if he is coming back. Um, I remember during the season, there was, you know, I think Woj reported it that he was opting out and, and people started shitting their pants and freaking out. Oh my God, Millsap's opting out. It makes, means nothing. It is as common sense as it gets. Kevin Durant's opting out. The Roosters are opting out. These guys are all opting out because it enables them to then sign their next co contract under the bigger salary cap for more years and get themselves more guaranteed money. 
It doesn't mean that Millsap is out of Atlanta. Yeah, he could have stayed for one more year at $16 million or whatever his contract was, but he wants to lock in it and get that. You know, he, at, at the age of 32, his last big deal, and, and I'm sure he'd be looking for a five-year, $200-plus million contract. I'm not sure the Hawks, I'm not sure that's in their best interest. Actually, I'm 100% positive that it is not in their best interest to offer that contract because it is going to be horrible. And we already saw a decent level of decline from Millsap this season. Now, whether that is age-related, which I think it partially is, or whether that is Dwight Howard related, which I think that partially is as well. Um, it's not going to look good at the age of 37 for Millsap being paid $45 million. It won't look good at all. The other decisions they have to make, well, they've got some important ones on the wing. Tabo Cephalosha is an unrestricted free agent, and Timmy Hardaway Jr. is a restricted free agent. Now, Hardaway is a guy that I did, I think he improved his game significantly this season. I still don't think he's a great player, but the improvements he had there are going to make him get a sizable offer. With um, you know, Kent Bazemore signed to this team in what remains a horrific contract um, and the play of Torian Prince and the, the drafting of DeAndre Bembry last season, I don't think that both of these guys return, both Cephalosha and Hardaway. And I guess it depends on what sort of offers Hardaway gets as to which one of those players actually does return. But they do have some decisions there. The other decisions they have to make, Mike Dunleavy has a $5 million non-guaranteed contract. I don't understand why he even played a second last season over some of the players that he played over, especially Tarbo uh, in the playoffs. And that's another reason why Tarbo might not be back. He just didn't play, which was, again, just completely... And I've got, I've got great respect for Mike Budenholz. I think he's a good coach. But pretty much every coach makes dumb decisions at some point. And to me, that was one that was absolutely nonsensical to have a guy like Tefalosha just not play a single second uh, or... You know, not not literally a single second, but basically not a single second in the in the playoffs was uh, was confusing. Ersan Ilyasova, who was acquired uh, in the, at the trade deadline, he's an unrestricted free agent. Chrissy Humphreys an, is an unrestricted free agent. Mike Muscala is as well, as is Jose Calderon. And Ryan Kelly has $1.6 million non-guaranteed. If Millsap goes, I can't see Ilyasova coming back. Um, then Cephalosha is gone. Maybe they bring Hardaway back in that situation. But there are a lot of um, decisions there. A guy I think they should prioritize is Mike Muscala, especially if Millsap goes. I think the Muscala can be an interesting third big. And a guy that uh, I, I, was, I was pretty impressed with this season, especially considering some of his rotational um, um, minutes were, were confusing because he was in and out of rotations at the expense of guys like Chris Humphreys, which never makes any sense to me. They were 27th in offensive rating this season, which is clearly not good. Fourth in de defensive rating, and that to me is a big Howard factor, just adding Howard in there as a as a key defender, which they haven't had for, for quite a while. Offensive rating, um, I guess some of that's part of uh, part of Howard as well, being that guy that, uh, that does struggle to keep an offense moving. They were 10th in pace, fourth in free throw rate. Again, that's a large, in large part due to Howard as well. 28th in turnover percentage, so they turn the ball over a lot. That's uh, one of the downsides, I guess, of Dennis Schroeder's game. But defensively, they uh, they were second in getting turnover. So made up for it on that end with some uh, ball hawking, as we know that Millsap is great on that end in being able to swipe steals as a power forward. Then you've got Cephalosha, and you've got Schroeder, who's pretty adept at that also. The best offensive rating on the team, it was Mike Dunleavy. He played very few minutes. Um, then Muscala, then Howard, then Hardaway. And the best defensive rating, no surprise, it goes Howard, Cephalosha, and then big Ryan Kelly, Chrissy Humphreys, and Paulie Millsap. They had seven blokes shoot 40% on corner threes. Unsurprisingly, Dwight Howard was not one of them. Ryan Kelly, Mike Dunleavy, Dennis Schroeder, Millsap, Muscala, Hardaway, and my man Kent Bazemore. Timmy Hardaway, you know, for all the criticisms I've given of him, and my criticism is word that he's a three-point shooter who can't shoot threes. But he improved his game, and he added other things, the, the passing, the assist, some defense to his game. And he also was able to finish 65% at the rim, which is a great number for a guy who was a perimeter-oriented player. DeAndre Bembry, also impressive at the rim. 63% as a rookie is fantastic, and so many rookies do, especially rookie guards and perimeter guys, struggle to finish at the rim. But he came in immediately and hit 63% at the rim. Unfortunately... He shot 6% on threes, which is horrendous. And that was the concern for him coming into the NBA. He was a poor three-point shooter. I think he was like a 25% three-point shooter in college. And somehow, well, not somehow, understandably, it got worse. Probably no, don't understand it to get that much worse, but he was uh, significantly poor 
from that area. Malcolm Delaney, who was brought in to be the backup point guard, he was just a 43% shooter at the rim, and he eventually lost his job uh, down the stretch and in the playoffs to Jose Calderon, which again, I thought was horrendously coached, um, given some of the deficiencies that Calderon has. And yes, Delaney struggled at times, but um, yeah, it wasn't working with Calderon either. The leader of the team on PER, I think some people would be surprised to see that it was Dwight Howard at 20.8, and he led the team in true shooting at 63% as well. And usage went to Dennis Schroeder. Now, in the preseason, I was hyping up Dennis Schroeder quite a bit, saying he's going to be a top 70 player, potential top 50 player, and he will lead this team in usage. And um, a lot of people were a little bit uh, skeptical of that, of him leading the team in usage. And no, it's going to be Howard. It's going to be Millsap. They're going to do it. But that, that's clearly not the case. It wasn't the case. It wasn't going to be the case. Schroeder does dominate the ball like that. And those other two guys aren't high usage players. So he did have the ball in his hands quite a lot. The leader on this team in win shares, Dwight Howard. Win shares per 48, Dwight Howard. And again, I think people will be surprised at some of these Dwight Howard numbers. Offensive box score plus minus went to Timmy Hardaway. I know I was shocked at that one. Well, defensive box score plus minus was Tarbo. Box score plus minus and Vorp was Paulie Millsap, who had 2.7 to both of those. So he did lead the team in that metric. But the, it was surprising for me to see Howard lead the team in win shares, win shares per 48, and PR on this team. Because a lot of people just think that he's cooked and he's finished and he's really, really bad. And that is just absolutely 100% not true. He is definitely not all-star legend type center that he was in Orlando. That is not who he is, but he is still a serviceable, very good player who who does have his limitations and things need to be changed when he's around, but he does, he still does stuff at a very, very high rate. And I think people, because of his you know, dickheadedness, which I'm, I'm all for saying that Dwight's a dick plenty of times. I, I do not think that he's not a, he's not a likable player as much as he does every single thing he could possibly do to become likable. I don't think that he's likable at all. But his playing, his playing ability is still fine. And people do denigrate him for, for his ability to play. When I, I still still do think that it is there. Let's look at their lineups. They had four lineups over 100 minutes. Their most used lineup, no surprise. Bazemore, Howard, Millsap, Schroeder, and Cephalosha. That played 425 minutes. And it was a negative 4.4. I'm not going to say that it's entirely due to the fact that Bazemore was in it. But Bazemore was in it. The best five-man lineup, Timmy Hardaway, Dwight, Millsap, Schroeder, Cephalosha. So just replacing Hardaway for Bazemore, that went from a negative 4.4 to a positive 23. Again, I'm not saying it's just Bazemore, but that's the numbers. The most used four-man lineup, Bazemore, Howard, Millsap, Schroeder was a negative 3.4. The best four-man, Delaney, Hardaway, Millsap, and Moscala for a plus 20.6. The most used three-man was Bazemore, Howard, and Schroeder. Unsurprisingly, it was negative 4.1. While the best three-man was Hardaway, Millsap, and Cephalosha for a plus 12.6. And the most used two-man, Howard, and Schroeder for a negative 1.8. While the best two-man, you see Hardaway's name in a lot of these as well, Hardaway and Millsap at plus 6.4. So that's... Uh, that's the way that this team, uh, I guess, played out during the season. Let's get into them and talk about them in more detail now. We'll look at the overall rankings of these guys. We'll start off with Paul Millsap, who was, I guess, a disappointment to a lot of people. Now, I was one who was probably on an island when I was preaching a real decline for Millsap this season. There were people who were suggesting to take him at the start of the first round, and that's something I balked at almost immediately. And I said, you know what, I think that this is... Um, a real time that he is going to decline. I know I traded him away in a dynasty league um, because of that reason I was rebuilding. His age, the addition of Howard, I expected a slip. I didn't expect him to drop to become the 46th ranked player, which is where he was this season. And he averaged 18, 8, and 3.5 and with 1.13s and 1.3 steals and got 0.9 blocks and 44 and 77 as his percentages. One of the reasons that he really did drop was the fact that his block rate went down significantly. Last season was a real anomaly to me. He was at 1.7 blocks per game, down to 0.9. And with Dwight Howard around, that was always going to be the case. He saw his rebounding rate drop as well, and um, his efficiency dropped with the uh, with the absence of Al Horford. All those things were, were relatively predictable, and that's why he dropped from the 15th ranked player last season to being the guy that was 46th this season. And in fact, after the All-Star break, it got worse. He was 44th pre-All-Star, 106th post-All-Star break. That is a 
big, big dip for Millsap. After the All-Star break, his block numbers dropped. His steals went down to 0.8. So he's rebounding. His assists drop as well. And his efficiency was still subpar and shot only 24% from three. Wherever Millsap goes, he's going to be solid. But if you're hoping on a bounce back to a second round player, I think you might be left stranded. Now, as I said, the main reason that his value dropped was the big drop in efficiency and the big drop in block numbers. So it depends where he goes. It depends what team he goes to. Will he go to a team where he can become a, a shot blocker? But I'll say this, last year he, he blocked shots, never did it before. And really, it was fueled by like a last three month of the season run where he just went bananas in blocking shots and it propped his season long block numbers up. He had never done it before. He had never blocked shots at that rate. He was going crazy. And it just seemed completely out of the blue. And for a guy who's now 32, when block rates generally decline, and they decline, yeah, even after about 25, they normally decline, but somehow he had this weird peak at 31. I, I I can't, he's not getting back to the 15th ranked player. He's not getting back to a top 20 ranked player, I don't believe. But it is going to be very situationally dependent. If he's back in Atlanta, then he's a he's a, you know, a third, a fourth round player, maybe probably a fourth round guy, I, I would expect, because I don't see much changing in terms of the block rate going back up or him being a big rebounder once again or you know, his efficiency going through the roof. I don't see any of that stuff happening if he remains in Atlanta. But going to other teams... Things may change. Maybe he heads to Denver and plays alongside Nikola Jokic. Jokic isn't a huge rim protector. Maybe his block numbers can go from 0.9 to 1.2, which is not 1.7, but it is still an increase enough for you to go, okay, this is something here. A higher pace game um, over there. He can do more stuff defensively with the steals as well. Um, rebounding, he might suffer a bit. How does he look you know, offensively? Does he get better looks with Jokic feeding him the ball? Probably. So that sort of stuff can change. But don't bank on him as being a second round guy. Don't look at him in a dynasty and go, oh yeah, it was a down year. Um, he was dealing with whatever he was dealing with. I'm going to get him and he's going to go back to being this guy that I want at the end of the first round. You don't want him at the end of the first round. You don't want him in the second round. And honestly, I don't think I want him as a third round player uh, anymore. I think that at this age, he's cooked as from being this elite. He's, he was an elite under the, radar fan, and under the radar fantasy player. But I know that you guys listening to this podcast knew that he was an elite, an elite fantasy player. But he is not anymore and I don't see him coming back to it. Now, as for his impact on the team, he was a plus 8.2, which is the second best on-off number on the team. So super impressive, and he is extraordinarily good. But I'm talking about purely his fantasy impact, and it has declined, and declined in a serious way. And at the age that he is, he's a, well, he's not 30, he's about to turn 32. Um, I, I do have do have my concerns. He had a PR of 17.8, so that was three behind Dwight Howard for the lead on this team. Let's talk Schroeder, who didn't quite get to my expectation of a top 50 player. He was the 60th ranked player of the season, averaged 32 minutes a game and 18 points just behind Millsap for the lead on this team. Millsap was 18.1 and Schroeder was 17.9. He hit 1.33s. He had three rebounds, six and a half assists, a steal, and 45 and 86 with 34% from three for a true shooting of 53%. Not only that, the Schroeder was an absolute animal in the second half of the year. Pre-All-Star, 79th. Post-All-Star, 41st. In that post-All-Star run, he averaged 19 points, had 6.5 assists, 4 rebounds, 1.33s you know, and 1.3 steals, and shot 93 from the line and had a true shooting of, of 52 because his field goal percentage didn't bump up that much, but he got more shot attempts. He took 17 shot attempts per game after the All-Star break, up from 15 before the All-Star break, and was a comfortable top 50 player in that time period. If Millsap goes... He's a top 50 player, and this is something that I've been stressing since the January 2016 trade deadline. If he starts, he is a top 50 potential player, a top 50 upside player, and we are at that spot now. He is going to be a top 50 player for the next two to three seasons, at least. Um, can he get better than this? Or can he get better than that 18, 4, and 6.5 and with 1.5 threes and steals that he did at the end of last season? Probably not. Can he get better than the 43.5% that he shot from the field? Yes. Can he be a, will he ever be a 48 guy? Never. 47? Probably not. 45? Yeah, now you're talking and that adds maybe an extra half a point and it also adds maybe three or four, maybe six spots in the rankings to push him to, to maybe, maybe pushing to the top 30. 
that's not outlandish to me. Maybe you think it is outlandish. Maybe he hits his threes at a higher rate. Where is it 33%? Can he go to 37? I, I'm doubtful, but, but I do think that he can get there. And the thing is, a lot of these numbers, they don't really differ too much from his per 36 numbers. They're not far off. His points are about the same. His threes are about the same. He did see his rebounding drop a little bit this season, so there's scope for that to improve. His assists um, were, were marginally the same, a little bit down, and his steal rate also dropped per 36. So there is some scope for him to improve along with the efficiency. So I reckon we're locked into at least three years of a top 50 Dennis Schroeder coming up here, and he does have the chance to elevate his game. Now, plenty of people don't like Dennis Schroeder. They don't like his game. They don't like. Uh, they don't really like him from a fantasy point of view, which doesn't make any sense to me, but they don't think that he's a good player. I think that he is a solid average NBA starter. He will never become an all-star starter. He will never become great. And he's never a guy that you want to build your franchise around and go, you know what? We are set at point guard because we have Dennis Schroeder. Will he ever become as good as Jeff Teague? He's not far off it, I don't think. I don't think. I don't think Teague's that good. He wasn't that far off Teague. Now Teague was pretty good in terms of handling the ball and not giving it away. And Schroeder's got that uh, your tendency to be a little bit turnover prone. But otherwise, I, I'm. I think he's not far away from becoming uh, the caliber of a Jeff Teague as a starting point guard for this team. So I, I'm big on, on Schroeder. He is. Yeah, he's not that old. How old is he? He's 23 years old only. So he's still. You know. He's still away from his prime, so we've still got yeah at least three, four years of him being this top 50 guy, and maybe the improvement does really start to come. Defensively, he did have his struggles, but he wasn't horrendous on that end. Um, he, could, he could be better, but again, point guard defense is not something that matters more, and it doesn't matter as much as perimeter and big defense, um, but he wasn't horrendous there. Offensively, he was fine. He had an above-average PER of 16 true shooting of 53. Yeah, just really, I, th I thought he did quite well in that experiment. And there were times where he saw his minutes limited by Budenholz when they played Delaney for big stretches and Calderon. And it, it didn't make sense because as much as you want to punish this guy and he does have his, um, does have his concerns on court demeanor wise. He had that instant incidence where him and Dwight Howard were arguing a play and then the play kept going and the other team scored. And then he just was benched for the entirety of the game after that. He does have those issues. He had the visa problem that saw him suspended after the All Star break because he forgot his passport. Part not passport. He forgot his passport, or he had his visa expired. And he couldn't get back into the country, so they suspended him for a game. So he does have some concerns in, in that respect. But uh, he's 23. He, he does have room to grow. Definitely, we can talk about. It. He's 23. Chris Dunn's 23. Like there's there's a big difference between uh, those sort of players, and. Um, um, it's uh, it's going to be pretty interesting to see. He's one year older than Torian Prince, and I don't think that uh, people realize the, the, the difference that that can make in a player. He does have a, a fair bit of time to grow. Let's talk Dwight Howard. Now, his rankings are always skewed by the free throw percentage. So overall, I say rotisserie ranking, he was 70th. And for a bloke that shot 53% from the line on 5.7 attempts and had a Z score in his free throw percentage of negative 3.88, which is clearly punt territory, to be the 70th ranked guy, you're doing something right. In my head-to-head -head rankings, he was 26th. That is how impressive that he was. Last season, he was 22nd. So a little bit of a dip, but that's where he is. You're in a head-to-head -head league. You're in a punt free throw situation. That is the value that Dwight Howard has, but you don't have to take him at that spot. And a lot of people have caught up with the DeAndre Jordan, Andre Drummond. You know, they are guys whose ranking comes in at 90 or 50 or 60 or 70, whatever bullshit number they're arbitrarily given by certain uh, ranking places, Yahoo, ESPN, those sort of things. They're bullshit because they're unrealistic because people will always go to that punt strategy and they'll get picked in the 20s they might get picked at the end of the teens they'll get picked there dwight won't dwight will not get picked in that area i can guarantee you even though he was the 22nd ranked player last season he's the 26th ranked player this season you know based on yeah, eliminating this free throw percentage as a category which is what you're doing in a punt situation dwight doesn't go there he goes in the 50s he goes in the 60s he goes in the 70s and that is where value can be had in that sort of an area Drummond and Jordan, that value gets taken away a little bit because people are starting to grab them in that spot, in the spot where they probably should be taken. But Dwight doesn't. So you do have a little bit of an advantage if you're looking in that strategy of getting Howard late. Now his numbers, he averaged 13 and a half points. He did this in under 30 minutes as well. 13 and a half points, but 12.7 boards, that is a massive amount. 
almost a steal a game, 0.9, 1.2 blocks, and shot a monster 63% from the field. And that is a category influencer. You can talk about him being a negative from the line, which of course he absolutely is, but as a field goal percentage influencer, a positive 2.45 Z score is gigantic. That is a huge, huge number, and that is part of the reason why he's so strong. And those rebounding numbers and those block numbers, you know, decent points, decent steals. This is what he does, and this is why he is a really valuable head-to-head -head asset for the right team, and you build the right team. And as I always say, it's not about getting the best players, it's about building the best team, and he can be a real part of the best team if he is selected in the right situation and at the right spot. Now, that quote at the start of the show was about him saying he's going to be starting to hit threes. I don't think I don't think he's turning into Marcus Gasol. I don't think he's turning into Brook Lopez. I'm not worried that he's going to start nailing 100 threes next season, but he could start hitting them, maybe. It doesn't have any real impact to me on what his value is. Maybe it does dip his field goal percentage slightly, and that's a big positive in his game, and the free throw and the three-pointers won't be enough to add that value back, but I don't think it's really too much of a concern. Despite the fact that he was the 26th ranked player last season, I'd never pick him there. I'd never pick him in the top 30. I wouldn't pick him in the top four rounds because you don't have to. You can get him later on because, again, as I mentioned earlier, the negativity surrounding Howard means he gets pushed down and people say, oh, shit, he's finished, he's finished. You know, why not? 13 and a half and 12 and a half. I'm all right with that. That does what I need it to do. 63%, 1 1.3 blocks. It does what I need. And he only played 29.7 minutes. Now, granted, at the end of the season, um, he was in a, in a weird spot where his um, field goal attempts were, were, quite, were quite limited at times. He, still, he took under 10 shots a game for the season there. So it wasn't just the end of the season, some massive decline. His ranking didn't change all that much. Went from 24 to 32 pre and post All-Star. So it wasn't too much of a, of a drop-off. But he still averaged 13.5 and, and 12. 1.3 blocks, one steal a game after the All-Star break. That's pretty consistent if you ask me. So I was pretty happy with Dwight Howard's first season in Atlanta. We know his problems. We know all that. But from a fantasy point of view... Uh, he's going to be putting up these numbers for at least, I reckon, at least another season, at least one more year. Um, after that, let, let's see how long that Howard can last. He is 31. He's the same age as Millsap, turning 32. So there is uh, there is that concern of him being an older player. I reckon he's got one more year of being that guy that can give you some uh, some extra value in those in those punt builds. He was a negative 2.4 in the on-off numbers, which again is a little bit surprising to me that he was such a negative. It wasn't not because it's not that much of a negative, but he was a negative. Or Schroeder was a negative 2.2 as well. Let's talk Ursan Ilyasova, who uh, over his overall season numbers, he looked pretty impressive. 120th for the season. He played 82 games, 26 minutes a game, but the massive chunk of those came while he was starting in Philadelphia. When he went to Atlanta, it was a big drop off. He went from being he was 135th pre All Star, 184th post All Star. He averaged 24 minutes a game in Atlanta, 10.5 points, 6 rebounds, 1.2 threes, and a steal a game on 41 and 80 for a true shooting of 53%. That's not horrendous, though. I thought he would drop a little bit more. I didn't think he would come in and play 24 minutes a game. I thought maybe maybe the 2021 sort of zone, but he did play some more minutes here and played in those smaller lineups with Millsap at center, and some of that is, is uh, I guess, what restricted Howard's minutes to, to keep him at 30. Uh, it also restricted what Mike Muscala could do. Uh, after the break, after Muscala, played quite a few minutes at the start of the year. He played 18 for the season, Muscala, and just 12 after the All-Star break as Ilyasova absorbed a lot of those minutes. If they bring him back, Millsap might be gone. There is a chance, and we saw that he was a guy that if he starts and plays 28, 29 minutes a game, 30 minutes a game, then he's an ownable fantasy player. Will Atlanta want to go into the season with Ursan Ilyasova as their starting power forward? I'm not sure. He is two years younger than Paul Millsap, which I think a lot of people would be surprised at. He's only 29, so he's not that old. Um, so there is a little bit of hope there, I think, for Mills, uh, for Ilyasova to have you know, a draftable season next season, but it's going to depend entirely on free agency. I'm not expecting a massive drop-off in his form due to age or anything like that. His advanced numbers are all pretty good. I thought he was relatively... You know, very impressive during the season, especially in Philadelphia, and he exceeded my expectations in Atlanta. Long-term, is he a starter? Of course not. He's not a long-term starter for anybody, but depending on how things go in free agency, there's a real, real chance that he could be that starter in Atlanta next season, if, 
of course, they decide to bring him back because he's another guy that is out of contract that they might not look to uh, they might not look to bring back. But he was uh, impressive in both stints during the season or both teams that he played for. In fact, he was a plus five in Atlanta with the on-off numbers, which is obviously uh, pretty good. Tabo Cephalosha. Only 62 games for Tarbo, 26 minutes a game, just the seven points. But you wouldn't think that that wouldn't render you as the 125th ranked player, but it absolutely did. He got four and a half rebounds, 0.7 threes, and his value came from the one and a half steals, the 0.5 blocks that he got, and then yeah, decent percentages, 44 and 73 with uh, 34% from three. I really disliked the way that he was used in that second half of the season. Nobody can make any argument to me that I'll believe that Kent Bazemore is a better option than Tybo Cephalosha for all the restrictions that Cephalosha has. Bazemore is horrendous. And um, I thought that Cephalosha should have been starting over him pretty much from the get-go. That wasn't the case. But Cephalosha was still able to put up decent numbers. Now he's not a must-draft player, and he never will be, and he is a free agent, so we don't know where he's going to go, but he is a perfect stream option for that guy that can hit some threes, have these random big games, and get you consistent steals without hurting any percentages, and that's basically who Cephalosha is. But 26 minutes a game, I don't see the team that he goes to. I tell you what would be a good situation. I don't know if he'd want to go back to New York, but going to the Knicks. That would enable them to play Carmelo at the four. If he remains, Porzingis at the five, um, Courtney Lee and Cephalosha on the wings, and Frank Nilakina in the backcourt. I like that situation for him. He'd only be a 26, 27-minute-a-game guy still, but that's a type of situation where he could have some value as that real steals specialist who becomes a priority streamer type of a guy rather than a player that I'm putting a, a huge amount of faith in. He is 32 years of age already, so there isn't, uh, there isn't a lot of hope for him to get any better. And we probably have seen the best of Cephalosha. In fact, post-All-Star, he slipped to the 210th ranked player, in large part due to that uh, fact that um, Budenholzer, that's the coach's name, Budenholzer started changing things up and went with, a, with way more Tim Hardaway, which I can totally understand. Let's get on to my man, Kent Bazemore. 27 minutes a game, 11 points, 1.3 triples, 3 boards, 2.5 assists, and 1.3 steals. 0.7 blocks, which is an impressive number, 41 from the field, 71 from the line, and 35 from the three for a pretty poor true shooting of just 50%. To say that Kent Bazemore was bad, I think is an understatement. He still got way more minutes than he deserved, in my opinion. The team was 3.2 points better off with him on the bench versus him starting, and he, uh, I guess, faded marginally post-All-Star, went from 130th to 161st. After his breakout season the year before when honestly he still wasn't very good but seem, people seem to really really want to get down and, and go the old Danish backhand on Bazemore for some reason he's a great bloke he seems like an absolute ripper bloke really funny guy caring guy superb teammate love it player not good average seventh man at best not worth 70 million dollars not a starting wing and that is how I think that they should be look. They should be heading into next season, the Hawks, whether if they retain Hardaway, with Hardaway and Prince as their starters. Not Bazemore. He is not a starter. He saw his minutes drop by a minute per game. His scoring dropped. His rebounding dropped. His three-pointers dropped. Um, he kept his steal rate consistent. He kept his um, assist rate consistent. And he actually improved his blocks. But his efficiency went down. And that's no surprise. And I'll tell you why it's no surprise. is because last year he was out of the box with his um, efficiency. The two years prior, 52% true shooting, 52% true shooting. Last year, 55 and a half. This year, 50. You know, that's, that's, that's a big drop. Now, he did look a little bit better with his true shooting numbers after the break, with 56% true shooting after the break, which is clearly uh, clearly an improvement there. But he, he only played 25 minutes a game in that stretch. He can be that guy that gets you defensive numbers, gets you those steals. He did improve his ability to handle the ball. So that's, that's all a positive for him. But to me, if I'm looking at him from a dynasty point of view, I put... Nowhere near a top 100 value on him, and he's barely a top 150 guy, in my opinion, and that's the way you should be looking at him. I don't think he's going to be a draftable player next season. I just don't think he's good. Now, you might say that there's bias coming from me because I just don't think he's good, and I've been pretty consistent with that opinion. or well, not pretty consistent. 100% consistent with that opinion. And Maybe you think that I'm just saying this to try and back up this long-standing opinion that I've had of, of how he plays and what his contribution can be for fantasy, and you can think that. I don't think that's the case. 
I just think he's bad. And I think that the NBA, after a strong start to last season where he had you know, two, two good months, people realize, hey, you know what? Not good. And that contract looks bad. It looked bad when it was signed. And I, I couldn't have been more critical of it when it, when it happened. Don't value Bays more highly. Don't expect a bounce back to last season. It might happen. Anything can happen. I don't think that'll be the case. Tim Hardaway Jr. Really impressive season from Hardaway. He led the team in on-off at 8.9. I don't think anyone would have been able to predict that. And in fact, after the All-Star break, he was the 94th ranked player. He's played 27 minutes a game for the season in 79 games. Averaged 14.5 points, two threes, three boards, two and a half assists, 0.7 steals, and shot an efficient 46 and 77 with 36 from three for a brilliant true shooting of 57%. After the All-Star break, it was better. He got the big minutes, 32 minutes, 17 and a half points, over two threes, three and a half boards, two and a half assists, 0.8 steals, 47, 83, 37 for a true shooting of 59. He was absolutely on fire, Tim Hardaway, down the stretch of the season. By far, his, uh, his best season, there's literally no doubt about that with those sort of numbers that he was putting up. And But if, if you look at it, like last year, he still had a true shooting of uh, of 57% last season, which I think people would be a little bit surprised to, to see that he was able to be efficient as efficient as he was last season. But this year, he really took it to another level, was able to hit big shots, key shots late in games, you know, take over. He had that game against Houston where he scored about 20 points in a quarter. Um, his defense did improve. It's still not great. His ball handling improved. They used him as a point guard at times when they didn't want to run with Delaney and he handled the ball. They did it with Bazemore too, which is not a great idea. Although Bazemore did okay in that role, but I still don't think that's a good idea. But Hardaway was, was solid, really good true shooting, really good PDR, you know, solid win shares, numbers, box score, plus minus, all the advanced metrics you know, point to solidness. Now, what sort of contract he gets is the big question. If someone offers him 15 million a year, I'd probably say, you know what? Thanks, but no thanks. I've already got um, money wasted on Kent Bazemore. Do I want to throw another 15 million on a guy that is limited in Tim Hardaway? And for all the criticisms I have had of him of being a three-point shooter that can't shoot, he has got that part of his game going again, and he can score. And he was really, really impressive this season. And even the trade that it seemed like the Knicks won when they traded him on draft night, they ended up losing because, because here we are with Hardaway actually developing into a player. He's 24 years of age, heading into restricted free agency, and then he is an interesting guy, especially with that top 100 second half finish to the season. Do I expect him to go you know, and, and maintain that second those second half numbers? Well, I think if he comes back to Atlanta, he, he's, got a, he's got a shot at it. I don't know whether he can go at 47% from the field for an entire season. I reckon that might be pushing it just a little bit, but he's going to be a good free throw shooter, and he should be a 36 plus three point shooter and hopefully get to plus 45 on the field goals. And with that extra ability to get some assists, maybe he can push that to three, especially if Millsap goes, who handles the ball a bit, maybe that gets a little bit more into Hardaway's hands. He's got every chance to be a top 90 player next season. If he remains in Atlanta, his location is obviously going to be dependent. If someone signs him to a big enough deal that Atlanta doesn't match, then it probably means he's going to have a decent role in that team, but it does de depend on what team that is. But I can totally see, and if I'm, you know, you want to stake something on it, he will be a top 100 player next season is my expectation. I still don't think he's great. I still don't think that you want him as a starter on a good team, but he was, has improved significantly and the numbers started to come. And I think that you'll get a top 100 season out of him next season. If I had to you know, bet anything either way, that's the way I'd look at it for, for Timmy Hardaway. Mike Muscala, as I said, strong start to the year, really, really strong, and then faded out completely. 18 minutes a game, six points, three and a half rebounds. And it wasn't necessarily him fading. It was more that he was he was faded. He just got pushed out of the rotation, which I thought was incorrect, especially when spuds like Chris Humphreys were getting minutes. Six points, three and a half boards, 0. 0.73s, threes, half a steal, half a block, 50, 77, 42 as his shooting percentages, which is great. A 60% true shooting. Obviously, that's very impressive as well. Um, before the All-Star break, he was 188th ranked player. After, 262nd. He did have a negative 4.5 with his on-off numbers, but I thought that he was, a, he was clearly their third best big, and it never really made much sense to me why you would limit him. Um, yes, Ilyasova was there 
and, and that did that did impact him, no doubt. But playing Chris Humphries over him was uh, was never a common sense thing. But like so much on this team, Ilya Sova, Millsap, Cephalosha, Hardaway, like these are four blokes who are really key parts of that rotation, and and Muscala even. It's a, it's a fifth bloke, like. How do they? How do they all you know, appear? Or how does it all work for them next season? You could see him getting twenty minutes a game next season if Ilyasova and Millsap both don't come back. Um, I don't think that pushes him to be a top one hundred guy. Far from it. I don't even think it necessarily makes him a top one hundred and fifty guy. But he does have value for those deeper leagues. He can hit the three pointer. He can provide some okay defensive numbers, and he can be really solid efficiency wise. And that can be a, a really useful thing for fantasy players as well. Torian Prince, um, shit start to the year, no doubt about that, barely played, 59 games for the year, 17 minutes, but after the All-Star break, looked really, really good, and started in the playoffs, and looked good, and I will, I will be stunned if he is not the opening day starter for this team, stunned. After the All-Star break, um, he was the 209th ranked player, but even that is underselling what he was able to do. The team, with him being a rookie, the team was 0.3 points better with him on the court, which is a, a real a real surprise. If we look at what he did post-All-Star, 8.4 points and 3.5 and rebounds. There's nothing spectacular, but this is in 24 minutes. I think he's a 30-minute player next year. I think he can be a 12-6 and six player. He had 0.8 threes. I think he, he gets over a three a game. 1.2 steals, 0.7 blocks. Could he be a 1.3, 1.0 steals and blocks guy? Yeah, an over two steals and blocks combined guy. Absolutely, he could. Will his shooting improve? It almost invariably does from rookies to second year. He was at 42 and 73 after the All-Star break, 36% from three. Can he become a 46 and 75 guy? Of course he can. And that pushes him from being that guy that's um, that's uh, you know, just around the 200 mark after the All-Star break, very comfortably inside the top 120, I think, for, for Tory and Prince. I would be stunned. Again, I'll say it again because that's how stunned I would be. I'll be stunned if he is not the starter for this team on opening night. He can play the three. He can play the four. If Millsap goes, it opens it up even further for Prince to become this player they really start to build around. And I, I do think that his upside is probably top 75. Um, if he had one top 50 season in his career, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be stunned. I wouldn't be banking on it, but I think he's probably a top 75 type of guy. But he was impressive. He was really impressive in that second half. Held his own in the playoffs. Actually, looked bloody good as a starter in the playoffs. And that is the way that they will roll next season. I am 99% sure of that. I cannot see another way of that going down. And uh, he is the guy that has that really high dynasty value at the moment pushing forward. And he is going to be a guy that, that gets drafted in pretty much every league next season. I can't see that. Uh, I can't see that not being the case. Mick Dunleavy, 53 games for the season, came across in the Kyle Korver trade. Um, it appeared like he wasn't going to play. There was talk of waiving him. That wasn't the case. That didn't happen. He played 36 games in, uh, sorry, he played 30 games in Atlanta. He's 36 years of age. I don't think he did all that much, to be honest. He had a good true shooting percentage of 60%, which is obviously fantastic. His advanced numbers were pretty good, but I thought he struggled at times with this team, and he was, in fact, a team worst, negative 8.2 with the on-off numbers. He is not going to be a fantasy threat anymore. Whether he returns to this team or not, I'm not sure. Whether he goes to any team at all, you know, turning 37 next year, um, yeah, I'm not sure how he's going to be able to have that sort of value for anybody. He's not a player that you want, even in 20-team leagues, even in 30-team leagues. Uh, it, it's on the way down. Malcolm Delaney, as the backup point guard on this team, had his moments, but he did struggle. He played 73 games as a rookie, 17 minutes per game. A lot of people were you know, curious about him or you know, skeptical of him, I guess, at the start of the season. You know, Jarrett Jack's going to play. He's going to take his minutes. Um, that didn't happen. Jack was cut before the season started, obviously. Delaney, 73 or 17 minutes, 5 points, 1.7 rebounds, 2.7 assists, half a three and half a steal. But the shooting was really poor. 24 from three and 38% from the field. I'm not sold that he is the backup point guard next season. They obviously lost faith and they played Jose Calderon, who, let's be honest, was terrible, ahead of him in the playoffs and down the stretch and went at times with Bazemore and Hardaway as a point guard rather than use Delaney. There were also times when they used him and didn't play Dennis Schroeder, which, again, is nonsensical and one of the criticisms that I did have of Budenholzer during the season. 
Delaney will be around next season, but I'm not convinced that he even gets the 17 minutes he, he played. That's going to be a free agency question, and there are going to be concerns with him. I wouldn't be shocked to see Schroeder get a couple of any extra minutes just because of how poor Delaney was at times uh, during the season. Surprisingly, the team was 2.8 points better off with him on the court than versus him on the bench, which you know, comes as a surprise to me, given how much he did struggle. Um, but... It's not about necessarily how much he struggled or, or what I think of him because Budenholzer didn't think much of him and he just refused to play him at times. And when you go in a cold run, that's a real lack of faith in a guy like Delaney. So that does bother me. Now, he does head into his second season and I would expect a, a pretty significant jump in some of those per, uh, percentages. He's not young. He's like a 27-year-old rookie who'd been playing in Russia and dominating over there. But those numbers should be able to come up as he gets more adjusted to the NBA uh, the defenses. And the, uh, and the three-point line, of course. But yeah, do expect Delaney to be a top 200 guy. I reckon it's probably going to be a bit of a stretch, but I wouldn't be stunned if he moves from 343 where he was this year inside the top 300 and maybe even sniffing the top 250. Although my, my likelihood of that happening is limited just because of the way that he was used and treated in that second half of the season. Chris Humphreys. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. 56 games, 12 minutes, four and a half points, three and a half rebounds. Started shooting, or no, kept kept hitting threes after he did that last season. Hit point three threes. Offers nothing defensively. His efficiency was nowhere. Him playing over Muscala. When you got is Muscala, Ilias over Millsap and Howard. Chris Humphrey should play exactly zero minutes, but that wasn't the case. He did play some time down the stretch, and it is uh, consistently frustrating when that happens. He only played 12 games post All Star, so he did start to get faded out and shot 29.6%, which is horrendous. The team was 4.6 points better off with him on the bench than on the court. And as an unrestricted free agent, I'm not certain that he did anything to suggest that he should get picked up by anybody. And obviously, his fantasy value is pretty much in the toilet. Speaking of in the toilet, Jose Calderon was on the Lakers, was on the Warriors for a day, came to the Hawks, had some moments. He he really shouldn't be uh, anything more than a third string point guard at this point in his career. His fantasy value is 100% non-existent unless weird stuff happens, which happens in NBA seasons where you know third stringer has to start a game or two and he gives you six assists and you go, shit, I could have used those six assists even in my standard league. But having any sort of faith on in him, even in 20-teamers, in dynasties, to have any production next season, I don't think that that faith is uh, is very well placed. He will be 36 years of age next season as well. So again, well, I think we're, we're talking about uh, the struggles of him being able to produce anything. Big Ryan Kelly was a team that I can assure you that a large percentage of people listening to this podcast would have had no idea that he was actually on this team. But here he is, 16 minutes, so 16 games, 7 minutes. 1.6 points. He should not be in the NBA. He shot 28% from the field. He's finished. Forget about it. There is no hope. There is no upside. There is nothing from Ryan Kelly. He provided maybe some signs of something at some point when he was with the Lakers. He should not be in the NBA. Simple as that. DeAndre Bembry, their second first round draft choice, was the 424th ranked player somehow behind Ryan Kelly. Somehow. He did not have a good year. I already highlighted his horrendous struggles from three. 5.6% he shot. 2.7 points, 1.6 rebounds, 0.8 assists in his 10 minutes, 0.2 steals. But despite shooting 6% from three, he was a 48% field goal guy and weirdly 38% from the line. Um, That's really bad. Yeah, it was not a good season from DeAndre Bembry. In the slightest, he had a PR of 8.8, a true shooting of 48% because he couldn't hit any bloody threes. His offensive box score plus minus was bad, but his defensive stuff was okay. He wasn't a write-off, and I think that he is a, a significant chance to find himself in the rotation next season. We've already got the chance of losing both Cephalosha and Hardaway. Bazemore's bad. Prince might have to play a little bit of the four. If Ilyasova, Muscala, Millsap leave, there's openings there for, for Prince to become a permanent four. So along the wing, there is some opportunity there for Bembry to play some minutes. He's a guy that handled the ball quite a bit, and they used him as a point guard in uh, Summer League, the Hawks did, and his assist numbers were pretty good. He does need to get that shooting happening, and that is going to hold him back. But he is a guy that I think you'll find in the regular rotation next season, 
and you know, be definitely better than the 424th ranked player, but I don't think that he is sneaking into the top 200 just yet. But in dynasty leagues for two years, three years down the track, anyone who's got that ability to average four and a half assists as a wing player, which he does, that should give you a level of intrigue on them. The ability for him to be a good defender and get steals at, at a pretty um, at a pretty significant rate, I think should be something that impresses you. And the fact that he finished so highly at the rim and was able to be so efficient, despite shooting 6% from three, which again is just ludicrously bad that, that he could not... He hit one three for the year. He missed 17. That is unfathomably bad. It will be better. He was not a good three-point shooter, but he should be a guy that can get to 30, maybe 29, that sort of mark. And that's a big improvement. But the fact that he finished so well at the rim gives you a, a, a bit of hope that he can become a player. So I do have some faith for Bembry. I've got his jersey up behind me here. Um, yeah, love his afro, love his story. I think there's a bit of hope for him because, again, I do like those wing guys who can distribute, handle the ball, and get some assists. And if they're going to be running hard away in Prince as they're starting two and three, there's not a lot of creation, not a lot of um, passing ability, although Hardaway did improve. There's not a lot of passing ability from those guys. So Bembry could be that extra guy that, that forces his way into the rotation next season and maybe maybe chucks up a top 250 season. That is definitely not out of the realms of possibility. Let's talk questions. What the hell does this team do if Millsap walks? Yeah. <laughs> they, they rebuild. They've got no other choice. Do they look to unload Howard? That, that's a possibility. Do they start to build around Schroeder and Hardaway? That's not a good combination. And Prince, that's not a great combination to build around. I think that they start bottoming out those guys and get some value happening, and then they try and get themselves a top five pick coming up because Millsap is super important to this team, and they are stuffed if he goes, really. But it does open up a ton of fantasy value, whether that's Muscala or Ilya Soverstays. Prince gets a huge, huge bump. Schroeder and Hardaway go through the roof as well. Even Howard, I think, gets more touches in, in that case. Jordan says, is it possible that Millsap can be underrated in reality, but overrated in fantasy? That is 100% the case. Now, Millsap wasn't necessarily overrated in fantasy really before this season, but he was unbelievably overrated this season in fantasy. As I said, people were saying I'm picking him at pick 12 or picking him at pick 13, and I could not for the life of me understand that. That never made any sense. He is underrated in reality. He is really good, but his numbers at 32 years of age, they are declining, and they are going to decline, and that is a simple fact. And yes, he is overrated in fantasy. Grant Shirley, what are my expectations for Torian Prince in 2017-18? He will start, and he will be a top 150 player, and he has um, you really he's got that chance to be a top 100 guy, no doubt. Kyle Norb, can Bembry crack the rotation next year, even if they keep Millsap? Yes, I think they, I think he will. They've got so many other things on the wing: Cephalosha, Hardaway, um, Muscala, Ilyasova, all these guys that you know, Dunleavy, Calderon. There's a, a definite, and I'm almost almost sure. Not I am I am sure that Bembry will be in the rotation next season. Kyle also says, I'm a little concerned that Schroeder has a touch of Tony Roten issue where he puts up good stats but isn't a helpful on-court player. I couldn't disagree with that more. I don't think Schroeder's great. I also think that he is... Tony Roten was bad, like worst player in the NBA bad who put up stats. Schroeder is not that guy. He does get a really bad rap, and he is not a good point guard. He is not a great point guard, but he is not a bad one. He is an average point guard who is probably maybe... He's, he's not in the best 15 point guards. No doubt about that, but he is a starting caliber player. And I'm trying to think if there are any backups in the NBA that you would rather, on other teams, that you would have starting over Schroeder. And I can't really think of any. He, he To me, he's like a top 20 sort of a guy. Um, Yeah, look, the team was a marginal negative with him on the court. It wasn't enough to be totally concerned about. He has his issues, but I, I don't think that that's, I don't think that's the case at all. James C says his Ursan still in Atlanta next season. I think a lot of that depends on Millsap and what they want to do, and of course what sort of demand there is for Ilyasova. But I think there's a there's a better than uh, better than fifty percent chance that Ilyasova re remains in Atlanta, but that's a, that's a complete guess from me at that point. All right, we're done. That is the end of the Atlanta Hawks season in review podcast. Subscribe to the show, iTunes, which now is called Apple Podcasts, Google Play, TuneIn, and Stitcher. And leave a review. It's always super helpful when you do that. You can always check this show out on Facebook and on YouTube as well. 
Don't forget, basketballmonster.com is where all our stuff will be, projections. We look to have that out at the end of August, start of September uh, for the next season as we as I work through those next couple of months, getting all those projections right and all our, uh, all our content and tools over at Basketball Monster as well. And check out the Locked On Podcast Network for our mock draft week next week over on Locked On NBA. We are done here, guys. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Dwight Howard.